Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about Langmuir, Henshelwood, Hogan, Watson procedures for deriving overall rate laws. Uh, the names here really start with with work by Henshelwood uh, and and uh, early on Langmuir. Uh, basically, Henshelwood combining the adsorption isotherm ideas of Langmuir to catalytic mechanisms. Uh, and Hogan and Watson came along uh, somewhat later, and they began to uh, make a systematic procedure for doing this for lots and lots of different cases. Now, the basic idea in all of them is that you take a whole bunch of different steps, adsorption steps, uh, uh, steps that you assume to be fast and therefore quasi-equilibrated, and then you have one step in the mechanism that you identify as a rate-determining step. That may be reversible or irreversible. Uh, but the key idea is that you go through and you derive the isotherms to get the coverages of all the different species first, and then you plug those species, con those surface intermediate concentrations of coverages and concentrations of species in the gas phase into the uh, equation that describes the rate of this one rate determining step, and then you immediately have the rate law. Okay, so this is the basic procedure for doing these kinds of things, and I think the best way to learn it is to just go through a few different examples. So let's look at the basic langmuir henschelwood reaction mechanism in catalysis. So uh, this one, we're going to, overall reaction uh, process is going to be A, reactant A goes to a product R, and the idea is that here we have a adsorption step first, so A uh, reacts with an empty site to give me an A adsorbate. Uh, then that A adsorbate has a unimolecular surface reaction to give me a product adsorbed to the surface. And that's my irreversible rate determining step in this case. And then my products can desorb. So this is my product on the surface over here. And we have a desorption step. I've written it as an adsorption step. And that's just because it makes the math convenient to do that. We just have to remember that as this thing actually turns over, this is going to be going the opposite direction. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and begin to set this up. Okay, so the two key things that we need to know in order to implement one of these is that our overall rate law is just going to be K times surface coverage of this species A on the surface, this adsorbate A. We also, of course, always know that we're going to be able to invoke this site balance. Now we have three surface species. We have a bare site, a site with A adsorbed, and a site with our product adsorbed. So we have a competitive adsorption isotherm situation. Let's recap how we did that. So we have theta A is Ka times the concentration of A times theta star. Theta R is Kr times the concentration of R times uh, the theta star. We can add these two together. We get a factor out of theta star here. Uh, this whole thing is basically theta star, and this is uh, this is one minus theta star over here. It, long story short, through a little bit of the algebra here, we can solve for the concentration of the theta star, however you want to work through this, those are the equations that you have. What it gives you is the surface coverage of free sites. Okay, so it's 1 over 1 plus Ka times concentration of A, Kr times the concentration of R. This was our competitive adsorption isotherm. And in this case, we're writing down the surface coverage of the empty sites. So now we have an expression for theta A, we just take this this theta star, and we use this expression right here to write down that theta A is given by this expression, and now we plug that expression for theta A into the expression for R, and we have our rate law. Okay, so it's that easy. The, if you work the steps in this order, it will really help. What we have here is a rate law that doesn't involve any of the explicit appearance of any of these surface intermediates, okay? And that's what we wanted, right? We want to be able to express the overall rate in terms of kinetic parameters like K and Ka and Kr and concentrations of species that I see disappearing and that I see appearing. So there is nothing else in this rate law other than those. This is the basic procedure you guys have seen. It's, it's really not so difficult. From this, you can see all kinds of things, all kinds of predictions emerge. You get reaction orders. You can see how R depends on temperature. If you know how K, Ka, and Kr depend on temperature, okay? Uh, let's do another example, just to make sure we uh, have these procedures down. Uh, so let's suppose that we have a reaction that's overall stoichiometry is A plus B goes to R plus S. And we're going to suppose that this is a langmuir henschelwood type reaction where we have uh, two adsorption steps first. A adsorbs onto the surface to give me A star. B adsorbs onto the surface to give me B star. Then A star and B star react together. And this is a langmuir henschelwood step. And uh, they give me R star and S star. Now, so this is like a 
uh, disproportionation kind of reaction on the surface. R star can desorb and S star can desorb. We're going to again write these equilibria as though these are adsorption steps. Okay, it's just easier to work the math if we do them all the same, even though desorption is really what's going to be happening. Our rate expression is the elementary forward rate uh, chemical step here in the middle, this rate determining step. And the other steps we're assuming, they are all going to be quasi-equilibrated competitive adsorption steps. Uh, so basically we're following the Hogan and Watson algorithm here, anticipating that we know what the uh, adsorption isotherms will look like, like this and like this. And now we don't have to work through all the algebra every time. We just sort of recognize the pattern and plug it in. When I plug these two things into here, I'm going to get a rate expression that looks like this. Now notice the hallmark of a langmuir henschelwood type reaction on the surface. We end up with this denominator, one plus all these concentrations. This thing is, is squared. And it's squared because we had two factors of the surface coverage. And each of them carries a denominator that looks exactly the same, like this. Okay, so when you start to see, you'll notice that things that are that are reacting from the gas phase, they won't appear in the denominator. Things that are reacting on the surface, they have to have gotten there first. And so the adsorption uh, steps that happen ahead of time, uh, they cause them to appear in these, in these denominators. And they can end up inhibiting the reaction, okay? So for example, if I let the S concentration become very large here, this term will end up dominating all of the others. And I will gradually get a smaller and smaller rate because of Okay, same with R, uh, same with A and B, really. If I let either of them become really, really large in concentration or, or partial pressure, then they will end up overwhelming the term in the numerator and causing an inhibition effect. So reactions like this can be inhibited because you have too much A on the surface. Now, why would that happen? Why would getting more of one reactant on the surface inhibit this reaction? Well, if you get so much A on the surface that there's no space for B to come on the surface, then you can't react. Okay, so I hope that that this kind of gives you some idea of what kinds of insight are packed into these rate expressions and, and what kinds of experimental tests you might look at to validate or to disprove uh, one of these expressions once you, once you have uh, obtained it from a mechanistic hypothesis. This can give rise to these non-monotonic effects, right? So if, for example, if I increase A, I need some amount of A on the surface to react. And initially, increasing the A concentration from zero causes the rate to go up. But if I keep increasing A, uh, then I eventually have so much A on the surface, there's no B anymore, and my rate has to go back down. So this is this non-monotonic behavior that can result. So let's do the eli Ridiel type mechanism now. Same overall stoichiometry. We have A plus B goes to R plus S. But in this case, we're going to propose a rate determining step that is of eli Ridiel type instead of instead of langmuir henschelwood type. B is not going to be on the surface. We're going to have an adsorption of A right here. We're going to have no adsorption of B. It comes directly from the gas phase and reacts with the surface A. A surface R species and, a, and an S gets released into the gas phase. Now S, we're going to assume, can come back onto the surface right here. Uh, it can come back onto the surface and make an S adsorbate. Uh, also R can come back uh, on the surface or off the surface to make uh, adsorbates or free R species. So these are all the equilibria that we have to deal with. One, two, three, and this is our rate determining step. This is the rate law that we're gonna to use to plug this in. Our competitive adsorption step now includes how many species? There's a problem here. I do not wanna have this term on this denominator, okay? Uh, so I, I don't know. We, we derive the fractional coverage of species A is Ka over one plus Ka plus Kr plus Ks. So these are the three surface intermediates. And I can now plug this expression into this rate law. And what do I get? I get something that is uh, in the numerator proportional to A and proportional to B. Uh, and it can be inhibited by the R and S concentrations if those get too large, okay? So that would be that your surface is poisoned by the products. They are all stuck all over the surface and preventing any A from coming onto the surface where it can react. Okay, in this example, we're gonna do a reversible Langmuir-Henschelwood type 
uh, reaction, uh, where our rate determining step is a reversible step. We still have adsorption of species A onto the surface. We have as adsorbed A reacts with an empty site. This is a langmuir henschel wood type step, and it's going to disproportionate to give me an R star and an S star. And then the R star and S star can desorb, giving me my final product R and S both in the gas phase. Now, I know how to go through and derive the competitive adsorption isotherms for all these species. We now have we now have A star, R star, and S star, and star as our surface intermediates, okay? So those are the equations that we get from a competitive adsorption isotherm. I won't go through that detail again. But now the key difference that we're going to encounter in this problem is that our rate determining step is reversible. And because of that, it has a uh, forward part right here, and it has a backward part right here, okay? Uh, so the forward and the backward part now, I can take these expressions that we derived from the adsorption isotherms, and I do the same thing that I would have done before. I plug in those expressions for my surface coverages. And what I get is an expression that looks like, that looks like this. Okay, I'm going to circle this as my intermediate, and I'm going to redo that step down there at the bottom. Okay, uh, so I don't really like the way I wrote that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's perfectly fine. But there's something that's really convenient and useful to, to do. So we have derived our rate law, and in principle, we are done. But it's very convenient and, and quite useful to factor out the forward rate law uh, from the numerator. Okay, so let me do that in practice, and you can see how this works. So my, my rate law is going to be K1 times big Ka times the concentration of A. What I have left in the numerator upstairs is 1. Then I've got a minus K minus 1. Uh, KR, uh, KS times R times S, all divided by K1 times KA, all divided by concentration of A. All right, and this was all divided by, and then square that. Okay, so this is my this is my rate expression. Now I'm going to do a sloppy editing trick here. Uh, that's pretty easy for me. Uh, so I'm going to take this and replace it with what I'm going to call big K1, which corresponds to the equilibrium constant for this step. Okay, even though that step is not at equilibrium, I can I can write down uh, the equilibrium constant in terms of the ratio of rate constants. So K1 over K minus one is big K1. So that appears now here. Okay, so now this is pretty interesting because the overall reaction that we're doing here is A in the gas phase goes to R in the gas phase plus S in the gas phase. Now, look at what we have. We have the adsorption equilibrium. We have the uh, reaction in the forward direction equilibrium. And then we have the desorption equilibrium constants. Uh, if you want to think of that one over adsorption of S as the desorption downstairs. And then you've got the desorption of the R. So this is really a product of all the equilibrium constants for each of the steps. That this is K with no label here. Uh, and, and that means that this thing is just 1 over K. Okay, so I can write R now as K1 KA times A. The equilibrium constant for the overall stoichiometric reaction. This is my mass action ratio of reactants. And then I've got my denominator term. So this is really, really quite nice because I can often look this up in a you know thermodynamic table, for example, uh, without even knowing uh, what the properties of my catalyst are. This, this term is now defined. And I have just one term in that case that would be unknown in the numerator and a few terms in the denominator to deal with. It's also nice because it guarantees us that when the conditions at which this reaction is occurring correspond to equilibrium, the overall reaction, the reaction stops, right? So at equilibrium, the ratio of R times S over A goes to the value of K reaction. Then we get one minus K reaction over K reaction, which is just zero. And the reaction stops at equilibrium. The important point here, uh, these procedures for driving rate laws are consistent with your thermodynamic equilibrium rules, your chemical equilibrium rules that we learned at the beginning of the course.